and your um, light, even in times that do seem increasingly dark. We thank you for our friendships and our family and this uh, unity which we strive for on this island. Um, I cannot imagine raising my children um, living anywhere else. So this home is such a gift to me during such a hard time. Uh, we all thank you collectively for the ability to serve. We pray that you continue to give us insight as only you can to do what is wise and right. In Jesus' name, amen. For which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Folks, please, um, please remember to mute yourself. We're getting some people speaking in the background, and if we have to mute you, it becomes more difficult to unmute you when you'd like to speak. So until it's your turn to speak, we'd really appreciate it if you could stay muted. Everyone should just <laughs> check for text messages if someone else is having problems getting in. Just yeah, I'm going to try. Tonight, we have one proclamation for National Airborne Day on August 16th, 2020. Whereas the parachute test pl platoon composed of 48 <laughs> volunteers was authorized by the War Department on June 25th, 1940 to experiment with the potential use of airborne troops, began training in July 1940 and performed the first official Army parachute jump on August 16th, 1940. And whereas the success of the parachute test platoon led to the formation of a large and successful airborne contingent serving in World War II and to present and Whereas the 82nd Airborne Division was the first airborne division organized out of the success of the parachute test platoon and has continued in active service since its creation. And whereas the 82nd Airborne Division Association exists in part to perpetrate the memory of those 82nd Airborne Division troopers who fought and died for our nation. And whereas the United States Senate passed National Airborne Day Resolution on July 6, 2004, and whereas Grand Island, New York, is the birthplace and final resting place in Maple Grove Cemetery of PFC Charles N. DeGlopper, Medal of Honor, posthumously awarded the nation's highest, highest award, the Medal of Honor, for his heroic actions while serving as a member of Company C, 1st Platoon, 325th Glider Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne, at La Friere, France, on June 9, 1944, and whereas Grand Island is the birthplace and final resting place, in St. Stephen Cemetery of Lieutenant Colonel Terence K. Crow killed or trained airborne trooper serving with the 98th Division and killed by hostile fire while part of offensive operations in Tal Afar, Iraq on June 7, 2005. And whereas the Glopper Park has been expanded to honor all the island's veterans, including tributes for those killed in action and will be rededicated, rededicated as the Glopper Memorial on June 5, 2021. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town board of the town of Grand Island does hereby agree to proclaim August 16, 2020, National Airborne Day in the town of Grand Island and encourage its citizens to observe and commemorate this historic event. Proclaimed at the town board meeting August 3rd, 2020. I have the proclamation here. I wish we were able to have members of the 82nd Airborne with us tonight, but unfortunately COVID-19 has prevented that. It is signed by all the town board members and the town seal is affixed and we will give it to them at a future date. Thank you. Item number five is public comments on agenda items only. If you have a public comment on any one of our agenda items tonight, we, you can uh, speak. We'll be on, we're asking you to uh, have Tom moderate this for us, and please hold your comments to three minutes or less. Thank you. Hey, before we begin, can we hang on one sec? Somebody just called. I just, I just, somebody just said that they're it's not streaming live on YouTube, so I want to make sure that that's the case. It does appear that it is. While Tom works on that, just to confirm, um, as John said, uh, we are accepting comments in the order which the request was received. As Tom has stated before, if you want to take and comment but did not RSVP to get in the queue, you can always take and uh, chat in the comment below, but please uh, 
be reassured that everyone will get a chance. Um, even at the end, we'll allow people to raise their hand. Cheryl Chamberlain, you'll be up first. Everyone's given three minutes. Yeah, yeah hang on. I'm going to mute us for a second. Uh, Tom would like one minute. No, yeah, that's Am I supposed to begin? I can't hear anyone. No, not yet. We were muted because I was going to play. I was looking to make sure the YouTube was working and I didn't want it to play back to all of you. So give me one okay. second. We just have to resolve an issue with the other stream and then. There's 16 people watching the other now. Yeah, it's just a, a double ending of stream. Tom definitely knows how to do it. So we'll be set in a second. One of the few technical glitches that we've had with. Well, I don't know why all of a sudden this, when we started doing this, you didn't have to do this. It would end the stream automatically. And now you've got to go in and end the stream afterwards. Okay. So that stream is gone. Well, Thankfully, we have a very patient, kind okay. group waiting here to comment. Thank I, you all for that. I think we're good now. Cheryl, I think we're set. Okay. Um, hello. <laughs> I hope we're all good. I know technology. Um, hello. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak against Project Olive this evening. My name is Cheryl Chamberlain and I reside at 2953 Stony Point Road here on our lovely Grand Island. Uh, in educating our community and students on ecotourism, I remind them that we have a lovely and natural area for kayaking, sailing, biking, jogging, which I love to do, hiking and cross-country skiing. A comprehensive analysis should be conducted on the air quality and emissions related to the project during both construction and operation phases. Such an analysis should take into consideration weather patterns and impacts during all seasons so our tourists can enjoy Grand Island. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Up next is Catherine Hastings. Catherine, if you want to unmute, if you can do it quicker than I can find you in the list, you're more than welcome to. Thank you. My name is Catherine Hastings and I'm a resident of Grand Island. Regarding Project Olive, I'm here to tell you, our elected officials, that Grand Island is not for sale. The recent $10 million incentive to ignore the recommendations of our economic development, planning and conservation advisory boards and the voices of Grand Island citizens who will oppose this project was only made possible in June of this year when the town board passed a new law, number four of 2020. It's obvious that the town board did this with Project Olive in mind in order to bypass rules set in the town's comprehensive plan. I strongly oppose this $10 million buyout of our way of life in three easy installments. The final payment to be made only after the town issues a final unconditional certificate of occupancy. What are we to expect with this unconditional certificate? More trucks, delivery by drone from the warehouse, warehouse roof? TC Buffalo has been anything but transparent. We do know that what is up for trade with this offer includes, among other things, 
waivers of setback requirements, including allowing a setback of only 10 feet on the western portion of the property, an area in which we enjoy the beauty of the West River, peace and quiet, and the sight of bald eagles on an increasing basis. These things may mean nothing to TC Buffalo, but they do to the people who live here and to scores of people who visit Grand Island for its natural beauty. Don't ruin it. An increase in building height on top of a 15 foot rise resulting in a structure over 100 feet high. Amazon says they'll obscure the building from view. Do you really believe that? An increase in height of lighting poles to 40 feet, spilling light along with all the noise and truck traffic into surrounding neighborhoods. Don't turn our residential island into Amazon Island. Amazon can build at Bethlehem Steel, already zoned for them. Let them do it. Finally, they recommend that part of the money be used for infrastructure improvements and part for a community center. $10 million is laughable when it comes to infrastructure alone. A community center means nothing when the community itself is destroyed. Are we to shelter there instead of enjoying the rest of our island? We would rather maintain the quality of life we have now than trade it in for the 24 seven noise, traffic, light and air pollution this project would bring with it. Nothing is worth the sale of this island to Amazon. We also demand multiple public hearings and only after the public, including those without online access has all information on this project. Please say no to Project Olive. Thank you, Ms. Hastings. You. Uh, Kathy Rahill, you're up next. Thank you, my name is Kathy Rahill and I'm a resident of Grand Island. My statement relates to the recent incentive zoning request submitted by TC Buffalo in their sixth supplement document for Project Olive. My first comment is that I find the timing of a recent change to our zoning code to incorporate incentive zoning to be highly suspect in relation to the timing of the requested approval process for Project Olive. According to TC Buffalo's sixth supplement, quote, the town recently adopted local law number four of 2020, effective June 9th of 2020, which amended the town of Grand Island code with regard to its incentive zoning and PDD requirements. The supplement, the supplement goes on to say, quote, the amendments codified at code article 40720B and article 40720C paragraph two require incentive zoning in exchange for any waivers in a PDD and broaden the authority of the town board to grant incentive zoning. However, conveniently left out of the sixth supplement by TC Buffalo was paragraph B of article 40720, which specifically states, and I quote, on a case by case basis, justified by findings stating the reasons for granting incentives, the town board may by up to 25% increase allowable density on a lot or in a subdivision, increase height allowances, or decrease setbacks in return for on site or off site improvements or dedications that provide the public with greater access to the Niagara River or increase the amount of open space or parklands available for use by the community. Whether or not it was an intentional omission on the part of the developer is unknown, but I would like to remind our elected officials that the reason we have zoning codes and regulations are to prevent the exact type of pay to play scheme that is being proposed here. According to the code as written, the town board is not authorized to approve zoning variations in excess of 25% of our zoning codes and specifically limit such variations in height allowances and setbacks. Specifically, two of the requested variations are much more than the 25% as relates to maximum building height and side yard setback. Article 40720 says nothing about the authority of the town board to authorize variances associated with seconds, lighting requirements and approval for altering the course of a natural water course. I would like to remind our town officials that this is exactly why we have these regulations in place. So that even if deep pocketed organizations like TC Buffalo and Amazon offer the town $100 million, we cannot be bought off to ignore our own laws and disregard the protections put in place for our community. Thank you. Well timed, thank you much. Thank you.
Up next, we have Dave Riley. Good evening. Hey, Dave, I understand you have more than one topic, so let's see if you can keep them all to three minutes each, please. Oh, yeah, I'll definitely be under three minutes for, the, for, for each. Um, thank you. Um, so first off, I'd, I'd like to talk about the Amazon warehouse proposal. And, and in particular, I'm, I'm having real difficulty understanding the board's logic of entertaining the idea of um, scheduling a public hearing before the steps have been taken to provide the full information, not just to the public, but to the board. The entire concept of the CICRA process is intended to inform not just the board, but everyone in the process, and that includes the public. For To ask us to speak at this stage, when we are still waiting for information from consultants, we're waiting for information coming back from the town in response to public comments that have been made, when we're waiting for information on everything from air quality to noise uh, um, measurements to a whole host of other issues, I don't understand how the town can entertain this concept of a public hearing at this stage. The second, and I think in some ways a more important issue that I think needs to be resolved right off the bat, is for the town board as the lead agency in the secret process to issue a determination of significance and in particular a positive declaration. Um, if, uh, as you all know, if a proposed action may have the potential for at least one significant environmental impact, the lead agency must issue a positive declaration. And environment is very, very broadly understood. Listening to the earlier discussion uh, in, the, um, in the earlier meeting, um, environment and, and uh, economics were separated out as issues. But for the purposes of CICRA, they're not. They fit into the same categories. Physical conditions such as land, air, water, plants, animals, human health, agricultural, historic, aesthetic resources, um, socioeconomic considerations, the existing character of the communities and neighborhoods, all of these things fit into CICRA. And so it's critical that as soon as one of those issues reaches that standard of, of having a significant impact that is not readily mitigated through what's been discussed, it's time to declare a positive seeker. And so I submit to you that the board's failure to do so up until this point is compromising the ability of the public to engage in the process in a more meaningful way and to feel a sense of urgency that does not need to be there if in fact the board makes that declaration now and engages in a process that confirms that we will have seconds, the opportunity to weigh in on uh, through the scoping process and through a more active public participation process. So moving on now to the, um, the special use permit requirement for Grand Island development uh, on 1611 Whitehaven Road. I appreciate very much the comments that were made in the earlier meeting. The one thing that I would ask and recommend is that the board consider setting a very clear deadline on when those requirements need to be met by. Otherwise, the special use permit will be pulled. I think that is absolutely essential because that business has had, I, I would guess, at least a year now to come into compliance with their site plan and with all of the other terms. The fact that they have chosen not to respond to that and not to take those steps, even in the midst of litigation, is a very clear indication that they have no interest in being compliant with the town's codes and the town's requests and the town's regulations. So I'll leave that point to that. Regarding the newly proposed South Point development concept plan, on July 21st, I requested in writing that the board rescind any prior approvals to the South Point developers and uh, terminate the PDD designation in order to protect the character of our island and our community. Um, to those requests, I would assert the following three additional points. First, the requirements of the State Environment, Environmental Quality Review Act, CICRA, will be violated if any one or more of the approvals requested on behalf of the developers of this project is decided prior to the project sponsor's preparation of a supplemental EIS, followed by a public review and a commentary envisioned by CICRA. Second, it would be improper for the town of Grand Island to rely on additional supplemental or updated information, data, or studies submitted by or on behalf of the project developer outside of the secret review process in light of how many modifications have been made to the project over time. 
And third, the SEIS must take a mandatory hard look at, without limitation, potential impacts of the project and proposed sewer district extension on traffic, character of the existing neighborhood and community, existing patterns of population concentration, distribution and growth, wetlands, drainage, and public infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Dave. Mr. Riley. I think that's Mike W. Ray Hill. Mike Ray Hill, you're getting a request to unmute. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry. Are you, you mean myself or my son? I think Mike W. is your son, correct? That's correct. But if he's... If you're on, we'll yeah, let him you're know up. later. Okay, thank you very much and good evening. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Mike Rahill and my residence is at 255 Timberlink Drive. I'd like to make some comments about Project Olive. My comments are in the form of a request to the town board. I would appreciate a response to my request prior to setting the agenda for the next town board meeting. I would like to know how a citizen of Grand Island or better yet, a group representing a large number of citizens of Grand Island could be added to the agenda whenever Trammell Crow Buffalo or any of its associates like Phillips Lytle, for example, are put on the agenda for the town board meeting or if Project Olive will be discussed at the town board meeting. Since the inception of Project Olive, it seems that Trammell Crow Buffalo and its associates have had real time and unfettered access to the town board of Grand Island. Even when the citizens of Grand Island were under the impression that the town of Grand Island was closed for business due to the pandemic. Since Trammell Crow has enjoyed this real time and unfettered access to the town board, they've been free to positively discuss Project Olive Additionally, Trammell Crow Buffalo has presented various analyses, which all portray Project Olive in a positive light. They have not been limited to the three minutes during the public comments portion of the town board agendas to make their case for their project. Meanwhile, any views for the citizens of Grand Island have been limited to these three minutes of public comments. If Project Olive was not officially on the agenda, these comments had to wait until the end of the regular town board meeting to be heard. Most of these views had to be voiced over a virtual video software called Zoom. And we all seem to recognize tonight how well that works. Because of the pandemic, many people had to either try to read the documents submitted by Trammell Crow and their associates on the Town of Grand Island website, if they were posted to the website, or they had to wait to hear the public comments using a remote video software like Zoom or YouTube. Many technology challenged residents of Grand Island lack the knowledge or the means to be able to do this. 30 seconds, Mr. Ray. The real time access to these conversations with the town board is critical. As was just mentioned, many people lack the knowledge, the means, or the patience to hear the remote and restricted views of their fellow citizens. So in conclusion, I'd like to refine my original request by asking the town board to invite a representative from cred for gi to participate in any meeting, town board meeting or town board workshop where Trammell Crow, its associates, and or Project Olive is on the agenda. I would appreciate a response from you in time to have a cred for GI representative be added to the next qualifying agenda. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Rahill. Um, Nicole Gerber. Good evening. Um, my name is Nicole Gerber and I'm here to speak against the Amazon warehouse proposal. Before a public hearing on the Amazon warehouse is scheduled, a number of steps need to be taken to ensure that the public is informed of the consequences of this massive project. The town board should make a determination of significance on the project in the form of a positive declaration 
which initiates a set of scoping and public participation processes. One very significant analysis that has not been conducted and not discussed by TC Buffalo or at any of the town meetings is an air quality and air emissions analysis. The town board needs to ensure a year long comprehensive air analysis occurs that addresses both construction and operational activities. TC Buffalo actual, actually states in their documents that the project will not have any significant adverse impacts on air quality, but they do not provide any detailed air quality or air emission studies to base that statement on. Before a public hearing is scheduled, all consultants hired by the town of Grand Island for the purpose of reviewing this project should complete all their reports and TC Buffalo should respond to all those reports as well as the advisory board recommendations. All this information is the basis for the public hearings. The New York State Environmental Quality Review Act and its environment impact statement provides government agencies such as yourselves and the public a means to systematically and thoroughly review potential environmental impacts. The town board needs to take action on both these critical review elements. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gerber. Uh, Mr. Rhymes, Brooks Rhymes. Can you hear me? We can, sir. Thank you. Okay. My name is Brooks Rhymes. I live on Cottagewood Lane, and I've lived on Grand Island for about 40 years. I'm appalled by the $10 million that was offered to the town board. It's called an incentive. I, I would call it more a bribe. Amazon wants you to skip the studies on traffic and the environment and just vote yes. I, I think this is so wrong. I'm also really concerned about the 500 trucks per day, which is a truck every three minutes. After reading about Amazon warehouse traffic in other cities, that seems like a gross underestimate. A full study needs to be done on this. Hundreds of diesel trucks idling continually will be terrible for air pollution. And these truck drivers are not Amazon employees, but subcontractors that Amazon has no direct control over. And no truck drivers follow the five minute rule. Drivers leave trucks idling for hours. There is no one that will enforce a five minute rule on truck idling. Amazon wants a pilot program so they can pay a small fraction of the taxes that a business of this size should pay. After 15 years, the taxes are supposed to go to normal. But what Amazon does after 15 years is either leave or threaten to leave if they don't get another 15 years of tax breaks. Jeff Bezos is the world's richest man with a net worth of almost a trillion dollars and Amazon pays no federal taxes. Amazon owns nothing, they lease everything. So after 15 years, they can just pack up and leave a monstrous hulking building that is no longer their problem, but the town's problem. This is a list of abandoned Amazon warehouses. Georgetown, Washington, McDonough, Georgia, Red Rock, Nevada, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, Munster, Indiana. Amazon is building a warehouse of the same size in Syracuse in an industrial corridor, not in a residential area. That's where warehouses should be built that are like this size. They should be built in industrial areas, not next to people's homes. Anyone who thinks Amazon is here to help Grand Island is naive. They are here to use us and exploit us, then to leave when they're done with us. The town, board has seconds, a duty, Mr. Rhymes. the town board has a duty and responsibility to the residents of Long Road, West River Road, and all of us who depend on these bridges to vote no to this monstrous warehouse. Amazon is not our friend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Rhymes. Maureen, Maureen Phillips, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. My name is Maureen Phillips. I'm a West River homeowner. Uh, and I'm also co-founder of the Coalition for Responsible Economic Development for Grand Island, along with my fellow veteran, Kathy Rayhill. Uh, we are here to talk about Project Olive because we want to uh, share as much information as we possibly can with the town council, uh, knowing that the thousands of pages submitted by TC Buffalo are not even searchable. So what we have done is taken uh, responsibility uh, section uh, at a time uh, on our uh, group of supporters, which is about 1,300 or 
uh, about 10% of your registered voters on Grand Island. And we've accomplished that in only about a month. So the more information we get out there, the more petition signers we get because it's uh, patently obvious that this is gonna be damaging to the town. So I'm, I wanted to address the fact that executive, uh, the county executive pollen carts threw this into your laps last week after we had shown up in force um, and basically says, say, says to you that if you do not approve this, then it's your fault that Western New York didn't get these jobs. So let's leave aside the fact that the warehouse is already designed to be robot roboticized in about 15 years anyway. Let's not talk about the jobs. Let's talk about the company. Do we really want that business as our business neighbor? I don't think so. Amazon has a record of crushing small businesses. And if you want to learn about that, you only need to look at last week's testimony by Jeff Be Bezos before Congress under antitrust violations. The company does not deal honestly. Uh, it's predatory. It has a method for establishing itself in towns that does exactly what it's done here in our town to show up uh, on the sly to pass papers under the door during quarantine, expecting you to process them, to keep its name out of the uh, process, as Councilman Madigan pointed out earlier. And uh, it does not deal uh, fairly and uh, honestly with the towns that it's trying to establish itself in. Uh, seconds, I would like to ask you, Tom and Jen, John, Pete and Mike, I'd like to ask you to take this idea back to pollen carts and tell him to incentivize Bethlehem Steel, which is already zoned industrial, and put it there where there are so many people who need the jobs that Amazon would offer. This is a residential agricultural community, an island with rickety bridges. Let's be serious. Thank you, Ms. Phillips. Is, is Marsha with you? Uh, nope. Okay, we don't have her there. All right, thank you. Um, Tom Eagle. Yes, can you hear me? Did I get that right or close anyway? It's I Eagle. Eagle. I, I apologize. You have the floor, Great. sir. Yep, Tom Eagle, uh, 2980 Bedell Grand Island, New York. Um, Project Owl, how about letting it die? In short, Project Owl would be an end to the rural aspects of Grand Island. Zoning laws are in place for a reason. Reversal of zoning laws that would allow this project to move forward result in significant monetary losses, degradation and quality of life for all residents within miles of the site. In fact, for everyone on Grand Island. The planning board already voted this project down. So frankly, I'm not sure why we're still under consideration here. I attended the planning board meeting pre-COVID where the Olive team presented. Residents couldn't speak, they couldn't ask questions. At that meeting, the Olive Group presented a traffic study done in November. November, be serious. Anyone on the island knows when traffic is. It's during the summer, during tourist season. This year, due to COVID, it's impossible to do any kind of accurate, uh, any accurate um, traffic study anytime in the near future. Anyone who commutes regularly knows that virtually every day getting on and off the island during the summer is a bumper to bumper experience. Ever been behind two semis, one in each lane on the bridge? Not a pretty sight. This claim by the Olive Group of driving off hours, it's not enforceable or predictable. It is in fact a farce. There is no way to stop traffic at whatever time these workers or trucks want to cross on and off the island. How about getting off the island virtually every morning when the traffic's backed up to the traffic circle or halfway down the 190 to Whitehaven or maybe all the way to Whitehaven? Yes, COVID has changed everything, but that traffic will return. Traffic is certainly not the worst effect of this project. Environmental impact, quality of life, and monetary loss to residents is a real sin. 150 acres of green space next to a bird sanctuary. Death to everything in the creek that will be moved. Displacement of wildlife to go where. Replace this tranquil setting with a seven by 24 highly illuminated high rise warehouse with noise, constant traffic, shipping activities, and diesel fumes. Is this what Grand Island wants? No, no, no. 
zoning laws are in place for a reason. There needs to be transparency into this process and opportunities for residents to attend presentation and expose the real impacts of this project. Local leaders like you must stop this project dead in its tracks. There are plenty of brownfield old industrial sites in Western New York where this type of facility can be built without destroying green space, killing wildlife or replacing it with noise and pollution. Show the populace of Grand Island that the town board has integrity and cannot be bought by a $10 million bribe. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Red Renard. Hi, my name is Fred Renard. Um, I'm a resident of Grand Island. And I had a huge speech and everything planned out, but to be completely honest, everybody before me put it so eloquently and really put the passion in there. And I just don't understand how you guys can just sit by idly and let this all happen in front of us. They want to destroy our island. They want to destroy all the ecosystems and all the population and everything. Just like the guy before me said with how Amazon just does a 15 year lease, they're up and out and they don't care. They just leave it like how downtown Buffalo and Grand Island look like a post-apocalyptic waste town. And honestly, they should be building that there. If they want to, you know, bring the businesses to Western New York, why wouldn't you put it in all these abandoned buildings downtown in Niagara Falls or keep it in Erie County and go down to Buffalo, go in Lackawanna, do all these places that are already industrialized. And I don't understand why we're even having this conversation right now. This is absolutely insane. This is not what Grand Island's about. We're a suburb. We're an agricultural community. We should be putting more of our resources into giving tax breaks and giving incentives to small business owners and farmers and keep it to ourselves and be more self-sufficient and grow all of our food and everything here. So we don't have to go out and get it from everywhere else. It's absolutely ridiculous. Like I said, that we're having this conversation. Why are we putting this next to Buckhorn State Park? Like, how is that gonna affect all of those that ecosystem, all of those birds, all of the wildlife. This is absolutely insane. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Okay, it looks like Steve Schneff. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Steve Schneff and I'm a resident of Grand Island. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this evening. Like so many Grand Island residents, I have deep concerns about Project Olive. For me, the chief concern is traffic. If you research Amazon fulfillment centers, it's rather difficult to find stats on the actual numbers of vehicles traveling to and from these facilities. It's very easy, however, to find stories about congestion and gridlock and how the increased traffic creates nightmares for residents and commuters. Now, whatever problems are faced by other communities, I believe they'd be compounded here by our unique traffic situation with the 190 and the Grand Island bridges. TC Buffalo states there'd be about 500 trucks leaving the proposed facility every day. Frankly, I'm suspicious of that number. The warehouse plans apparently call for over 200 parking spots for tractor trailers. I find it hard to believe that a warehouse open 24 seven would send its trucks out on only two and a half runs per day. We know these facilities can send out an awful lot more than that. Our citizens group cited a recent count of trucks leaving an Amazon warehouse in Los Angeles that came out to about 1,100 trucks per hour. If you were to take that facility and simply drop it here, you'd be looking at a 40% increase in traffic over the Grand Island bridges every single day. Now, anyone who lives on or commutes over Grand Island knows it does not take much to cause literally miles of backups leading to the bridges. Increased daily traffic to this extent without drastic infrastructure changes would surely lead to a major increase in congestion, not to mention a spike in motor vehicle accidents. It would basically be a nightmare scenario for commuters and residents. And at this point, I'd be somewhat dubious of any traffic study that concluded otherwise. Before saying yes to this project, I think we need to take a very close look at the traffic situation with the bridges and how adding all this extra tra truck traffic will impact the infrastructure. We need an independent study involving agencies like the Thruway Authority to determine exactly how much extra traffic this area can handle. 
We then need assurances from Amazon that they will not go above those limits and then have ways of penalizing them if they do. Maintaining a free flow of traffic over Grand Island should trump any other concern connected with this project. The 190 over Grand Island is a 30 major seconds, sir. traffic artery for this area. If you plug it up, you are going to create a collective heart attack for travelers throughout Western New York. So I do hope you will consider these issues and that you will at the very least ask a lot more questions about the traffic impact of this project uh, before moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Patrick Davis. Yep, can you hear me? The floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna say uh, thanks for letting me speak tonight. Um, I had something long and, and completely written out to share as well, but I'll, I'll try and paraphrase it because there's a lot of people speaking tonight. Um, I'll start out by saying I, I don't envy the way the decision the town board has to make in this subject. It's, it's extremely polarizing and I wish you guys the best in, in coming to a decision on it. Um, I would like to ask though, however, um, I know the Economic Advisory Board has asked for a full study to be uh, conducted. And I, I would ask that the, the town board actually uh, go through with that and make that study available publicly so that we can all understand what the impact to uh, both our taxes would be, but also potentially um, TC Buffalo's use of town resources. I think it should be very clear that any additional costs um, or impact to fire, water, local roads, other infrastructure should be covered by the new tenant. Um, and you know we should you know be eyes wide open when it comes to understanding what the cost of having that facility here actually is, and not be blinded by ten million dollars, which you know by all accounts it's about a million dollars per mile of road. So I don't think ten million dollars really adds up to a whole lot. Um, I also find that the estimated valuation for tax reasons highly suspect. Um, the number of buyers for a facility of this type uh, is probably close to zero. Um, and so $150 million valuation, I don't know any other buyer who would be paying $150 million for this facility. I can't even remember the last time a building of this sort was even constructed or sold anywhere within a thousand miles of here, um, other than recently, obviously by Amazon. Uh, so I, I find it highly suspect that whatever they agree to on the uh, taxable valuation would stick. Um, you know, as an example on Grand Island, you can build a house for $10 million of cash but you're only gonna be assessed at a million dollars because that's all you can sell it for. So you can build a $300 million warehouse. And if you can only sell it for $50 million, it's only worth $50 million on your tax rolls. Um, so my, in, in, I guess I'd finish up my statements by just saying, I find that the, the opaqueness of how TC Buffalo and Amazon has approached this project to be uh, highly concerning. And you know, they're, they're Forcedness of trying to push this project through during a pandemic with you know limited access by the town is um, you know highly suspect, and uh, I hope you guys um, realize that, and I hope you guys can see through the grandstanding of them pulling the project uh, at the last minute for the last meeting um, as something that is um, inappropriate. Uh, that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, um, Betty Tranter. Hello. Um, oh, thank you. Can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Okay, thank you for letting me speak tonight. My name is Betty Lou Trander. I live on 3003 Sunset Drive. Um, the property owned by William Huntress that he wants to sell to Trammell Crow for the massive distribution warehouse for their tenant, Amazon, is surrounded on one side by the I-190 and three sides by approximately 110 residential properties with people light industry and families, both young and old living here. We live here, have built here, knowing that the zoning codes for the development of this land between us and the I-190 was zoned as M1 development by the town's long range planning board. M1 allows for light industrial development only. And to correct Phillips Lytle attorney, it is not currently zoned for what they want. The current zoning of this land does not destroy the rural environment next to our homes, does not destroy the ecosystem of the land surrounding all our homes, does not destroy our quality of life and does not destroy our health and safety. Changing nine zoning codes 
and M1 to PDD to suit the greed of William Huntress, TC Buffalo and Amazon will destroy the rural environment next to our homes, will destroy the ecosystem of this land surrounding our homes, will destroy our quality of life and will destroy our health and safety. A massive Amazon distribution facility does not belong on Grand Island shoehorned into an M1 site with residential properties surrounding it. It belongs strictly on land already zoned for PDD industrial development, such as the site in Tonawanda off River Road is an industrial development or the old Bethlehem Steel site. Trammell Crow's offer of $10 million in exchange for changing all these zoning codes to approve their project is nothing more than a bribe. The greed of the developers in Amazon has destroyed many communities around this country with air pollution, noise pollution, seconds. traffic congestion 24 seven, seven days a week and 365 days a year. If this development goes through on this little island, I personally know of many residents of Grand Island who will have personally expressed to me that they will move to escape the disastrous consequences of this massive warehouse, my husband and I included. Thank you, Mr. Grand, Island, Grand Islanders and the light industry companies on Grand Island all will pay their fair share of property taxes as well as our fragile environment. Are they so expendable? Thank you for letting me speak. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Tranter. Uh, Mr. Oh, Mike Rahill. Michael W. Rahill, younger Rahill. The younger. Um, thank you very much, Town Board. I appreciate you having me here tonight. My name is Michael Rahill. I live on Grand Island. I'm here to focus on the invisible infrastructure that keeps our town running, how interdependent that system is, and the inherent risks involved with the proposed addition of one of the largest warehouses in the world to that limited infrastructure. TC Buffalo's inability to reconcile their estimated benefits, which so far have resulted in significant reductions due to their modeling errors with actual data of the uncompensated public costs Amazon burdens communities all across the country with should be a red flag for anyone who values a balanced cost benefit analysis of such a large and consequential project. What is $10 million compared to 8.4 million per bridge in refurbishment costs that will have precipitated from this project? I want to be clear that multiple public hearings are required at a minimum after independent findings have been presented by agencies who weren't cherry picked by TC Buffalo. I want to be clear that anything other than a positive declaration for this project as a type one action will be a flagrant disregard of secret law. Does the present water and sewer plant have the capacity to handle added demands of this project in their present condition? I understand the capacity of the system when it was brand new over 40 years ago was 3.5 million gallons per day. But given how old the system is and how many necessary repairs have yet to be made, how close is the system from breaking down? Has Amazon dedicated funds specifically for the purpose of updating and maintaining our water treatment facilities? In the event of a sprinkler system failure during a fire, will the water supply and pressure be enough to fight a large fire in a 3.8 million square foot warehouse? Will the building have its own fire truck capable of reaching the over 100 foot roof of the building? If not, Amazon supply trucks uh, to the fire department, who would pay for the added training and maintenance on the trucks? If we're not currently able to handle the worst case scenario, when will we be able to? How many years after the warehouse is built will we reach that goal? Or will that goal just be pushed back further with this project? What is the current age of piping in the ground on Long and Bedell Road? What kind of material is it made of? The supply will come from the boulevard as well as West River. West River lines are very old and there are numerous water breaks when West River was repaved. With the additional stress on our roads, what other routes will experience water breaks regularly? Have the engineers at Langdon taken the time to drive down from White Plains upstate and actually inspect the current state of our water treatment facilities? Have they studied the system seconds, Mr. with the people who work on it every day throughout the year to see how it responds seasonally and which fault lines are the most problematic? Project Olive is really a Trojan horse. TC Buffalo is presenting the hollow shell of an idea of economic prosperity in exchange for Grand Island's forfeiture of communal sovereignty. 
please allow yourselves to consider the risks inherent in allowing this precedent on an island with so much to lose. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rahill. Patricia Palmieri. Can you hear me? We yes. can, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Good evening. Uh, Trisha Palmieri, Grand Island resident for 17 years. I've asked to speak tonight to encourage you uh, to a vote yes to approve multiple public hearings regarding Amazon's proposed Project Olive. My parents live in the Southern Tier, and unfortunately, I've seen firsthand how a big company can move into a vulnerable area and provide and omit information in efforts to gain support of the community and approve a project with big dollars offered to the community through means of payment in lieu of taxes, better known as pilot and money, which is made up of taxpayers' dollars. Personally, rather than giving tax dollars to a multi-billion dollar company, I'd rather see taxpayer, do taxpayer dollars uh, be offered to our small businesses, many, many struggling today, to expand and be able to offer to more local jobs, to those in and around our community. I would rather see taxpayer dollars be used to help clean up sites like Bethlehem Steel or Tonawana Cokes, also mentioned today. Uh, so that large scale projects like Amazon have a more suitable location. Public, public hearings get in the way with projects like these because the approval process takes longer. In February this year, by his own admission, it is the reason why our governor included in the state's budget to bypass public hearings, silencing citizens, an effort to dramatically speed up the permitting and construction of renewal energy projects. Public hearings are just not about who is in support for or who is in opposition of. It's an opportunity to understand why. Had it not been for those multiple public hearings that gave the citizens the opportunity to speak in the Southern Tier where my parents live, valuable information would have gone unnoticed. Valuable information such as personal past experience experiences, a company's past project that had come to fruition that resulted in negative impacts such as public health, safety, and environmental uh, effects. Most importantly, the opportunity to provide independent, comprehensive, and objective environmental, economic, and traffic impact studies that are not only challenged, not only challenged a company's proposal and position, but it changed it. All because of the voices of the people. Yes, all of this will make the approval process longer. It's supposed to. It's to allow time to collect data, all data. And anyone who tries to fast track a project of this magnitude without comprehensive and objective 30 data seconds, Ms. Palmieri. warrants suspicion. Our town board doesn't have to do this alone. I'm so thankful to our community. It's filled with educated and knowledgeable citizens, each who have something valuable to offer. So I ask to our town board to vote yes to allow us to please have our th at least three public hearings to accommodate as many in-person residents as possible to offer an opportunity to all of our residents, especially those who aren't tech savvy or have access to the internet to offer our positions, whether we are opposed, any concerns, to share past, past experiences, to shed light of any positive or negative impacts with comprehensive and objective studies, to leave no stone unturned. So as a community, we can help and be part of making informed decisions for a better future in whatever fashion is yet to be seen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Palmieri. Um, Mr. Snyadecki. Hi, I'm Jim Snydecki. I live on West River Road in Grand Island. And I'm coming out in favor of the Amazon um, project. What we have here on Grand Island is a bunch of fear mongering, fear and loathing people. You know, they, they, they didn't want the parkway. What happened? The parkway was success. They didn't want the uh, welcome center. The welcome center is a success. Um, we need a, a tax base um, that Amazon will bring to everybody. Um, we won't lower our taxes, but it will keep them steady. Do we want to be Spalding Lake where only the rich and famous can live? I know I, I don't, I, I won't be able to afford to live here another 10 years the way the taxes are going up. Um, I, I feel, I, I just feel that we're missing out on an opportunity of a lifetime here. And uh, by letting people steamroll you with their opinions and not facts is just not the way to go. And on, a, on another note uh, with the, the, the project, um, I'm requesting that one of the members of the board, Jen Bainey, recuse herself because of a conflict of inference, interest because 
She has a property bordering the project. And I, I don't believe that she can fairly negotiate or participate in any talks uh, on the project. So I, 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 I think it's a, an ethical issue as well as a legal issue. Uh, that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Supervisor. I'm just going to say that uh, Councilwoman Bainey does not have a conflict of interest that requires her to recuse herself. From this Wait a minute. How, you, I, I, you can't. You can't say that to her. She she lives by the project. She lives. I'm right the town the attorney. I'm giving a legal opinion. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. He he emailed, he emailed me separately. Mr. Cook. Roger Cook. Hi. I'm Roger Cook, I live at 1515 West River Road, and I serve on the Economic Development Advisory Board. And uh, just to uh, remind ourselves that on March the 12th of 2020, our board passed a resolution unanimously asking the town board to consider hiring an economic consultant to uh, review the, the uh, studies and proposals that uh, were put together by uh, TC Associates. Uh, and we did that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, we were divided as a board, different ones of us had different opinions as to the impact of this project. Some felt like uh, the speaker just before me that it would be a godsend to the uh, town, it would be generate a lot of revenue Others felt that it would take us away from our town plan goals, away from ecotourism and the things that we, uh, a lot of us valued. And so with that, we, that divided opinion, actually the uh, individuals who were probably more in favor of the project uh, propose, put the forward the resolution that we have an independent economic assessment. And I think we see just in the area of public health around COVID, how important it is to have good, informed, professional uh, opinions weigh in on these matters. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I don't feel at all competent to say one way or the other that this project is going to be the salvation of this island or the uh, destruction of the island uh, from an economic point of view. I have my feelings, I speculate, but I can't say for sure. I think there's all kinds of questions about really how much business is gonna be generated by this facility on Grand Island. There's been a lot of claims made by the chamber that it's gonna be great for our local business, but is that really true? When most of those workers have about a half an hour for lunch and get paid pretty close to a minimum wage, is that really gonna happen? What about jobs on the island? A lot of claims made that it's gonna create a lot of jobs. Is that really true at 30 some thousand, lower $30,000 uh, wages? I suspect Probably not, but again, I think we need an economist to study that and give us a, an informed opinion. So I guess my question, and I guess finally- 30 seconds, I'll say, Mr. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wind it down here. That, you know, Tesla came to Western New York. It's not exactly comparable, but they came to Western New York with a lot of promises. And now we have a building sitting down there, uh, hardly utilized, and certainly not an economic boon that, that it was touted to be. I think the issue here is the magnitude of both the Tesla project and the, and the Amazon project. These are huge corporations with near trillion dollars of, uh, of assets. And uh, they're, going, they're not gonna treat Grand Island like a lot of our small businesses do, which really do, I think, contribute to the, the quality of life on this island. I just do not see, I do not see Amazon having that same interest. Uh, I guess my, I would like to Mr. end Cook, my comment with a question, up, to the, question, to the board, question to the board. Has the board considered retaining an economic consultant to do a cost benefit analysis of this project? <laughs> Thank you. We, we're, um, we're searching for one right now. Roger, yes. Roger, I know I was at that EDAB meeting. If you could follow up with Councilman Marson tomorrow with respect to the name of the individual that you had uh, mentioned could do it, that would be great. We are at the point We're in the agenda where we have three residents who did pre-register to speak, but I cannot find you based on the name listed on your page. So if you could give a wave if you are Richard Garlipo, J. David Swift, or Kevin Nedwick, give a wave. I'm looking at a gallery view. 
I'm going to have to put more people up there. I'm not seeing a wave from any of those people. We'll check one more time at the end. Um, we just have a few more in the queue. Next up, we have Mary Beth Sheehan, if you could unmute. Can you hear me? We can, very mutely, very okay. softly, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. How about now? Better? A little yes. better. All right, well, I'll just take a minute. Um, my name is Mary Beth Sheehan. I live at 161 Fieldstone Drive, um, just speaking to oppose the Amazon warehouse. Um, there's several reasons why I oppose it, and other people have already spoken to the most important ones, uh, traffic, environment, health, economic. Um, um, I'm not going to go into detail on those. I'd rather spend the minute that I have to appeal to your obligation to the people of Grand Island uh, who elected uh, you to represent them. Um, not to polling carts, not to Nate McMurray, not to Erie County, um, not to Amazon. Um, back in November of 2019, the Niagara Frontier publication quoted, I, quoted Supervisor Whitney as saying, quote, I promise to do my best to work for each and every one of you, our citizens. Please know that your opinion matters. My door will always be open. I want to hear from you. Communication is the key to success. He was also quoted as saying, with the proposed Amazon and South Point projects before us, we are facing some of the most important decisions ever to come before Grand Island. Collectively, we must work together to make the best decisions that are in the best possible interest of the town. I need your input to make this happen. So tonight, I just wanted to say that we are communicating with you and there are things that the island residents are asking. We're asking for multiple in-person hearings. We're asking for a positive secret declaration. We're asking for an independent cost benefit analysis, updated noise study, traffic study updates, and information from Amazon as to how they're going to uh, use this facility. We need this critically important information at, uh, this critically important decision to also should be wait until we are not in the middle of a global pandemic. So when the citizens can be more involved. Uh, what I'm basically asking you for is that the citizens get more communication from the town board and are able to present uh, their thoughts and ideas and concerns in public hearings. Um, the quality of life of island residents is worth more than $10 million. 30 seconds, Ms. Sheehan. Please don't lose sight of what's in the best interest of Grand Island residents. Uh, Amazon and Erie County, they're going to be fine without a facility on Grand Island, but Grand Island will be fundamentally altered for the worse. So please don't allow Amazon to come to Grand Island. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Sean Christian Rustowitz. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to talk about the uh, Amazon warehouse and its effect on our air quality. The Amazon warehouse proposal is a 24 seven distribution center of almost 4 million square feet to which constant vehicular traffic will be occurring on the premises and on all the roads leading up to the site. The proposal estimates that the number of vehicles per day, which amounts to hundreds per hour, the traffic report does not take into account the number of hours of cumulative idling by the engines on the site waiting to park, waiting for loads, and waiting to leave the site. With constant vehicular activities comes constant air pollutants and negative impacts to air quality, all of which are scientifically documented to be detrim detrimental to human, animal, and environmental health. Air pollution causes or exasperates health conditions such as asthma, lung diseases, and cardiovascular issues. The microparticulate levels produced in the emissions are one of the primary causes of asthma in children. Microparticulates are produced in abundance when a cold diesel engine warms up. And we all know there will be plenty of cold diesel engines warming up in a facility located in our climate. It is worth noting that the New York State Vehicle Idle Restriction Law sets forth a five minute limit for idling diesel trucks and buses, but exempts vehicles when the temperature is below 25 degrees. If we said no to Love's truck stop just a few years ago, citing air quality as a main concern, how could we say yes to something like this when it will have an even greater negative impact on our air quality. 
Negative impact on air quality needs to be careful, carefully evaluated to ensure that the public health of the citizens is not compromised by the emissions from diesel powered trucks. From the documents provided on the proposal, it does not appear that Amazon or TC Buffalo has given this important air quality issue much consideration. The Amazon proposal also needs to provide plans to demonstrate how the warehouse will minimize engine idling and to ensure New York State agency regulations for vehicle emissions and air quality are followed and met. Such an immense and busy facility placed near the center of the island will not only distribute air pollutants to the res adjacent residential neighborhoods, but the pollutants will also be carried to the eastern portions of the islands as the winds predominantly originate from the west. The Grand Island community deserves consideration for the safety of our health and that of the environment. A comprehensive year-long air quality study is needed for this proposal. Say no to Amazon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russelitz. Mr. Mazza. Can you hear me? Yeah, Mr. Mazza, thank you. Hi. Uh, Jim Mazza, uh, I'm a former teacher, and I want to give the board members some advice as uh, I learn in terms of my teaching. Uh, one of the things I, I surrounded myself with, as I see you have surrounded yourself with, are books and all kinds of information about uh, biology, which I uh, involve myself with. But one of the things I found out to be most effective was to communicate directly with the kids to find out exactly what it is that they wanted to know and what I could avail myself uh, to them. Um, and unfortunately, what I see is a board, which apparently is involved with the books and it's good, but not so much with the community. Um, I want you to know that there were over a hundred people well over 100 people surrounding the town hall today, as you may have known as you uh, went in. Um, that was disappointing to me in that no one stopped to say, hello, how are you? What's going on? And that's the problem. There are 2,000 signatures indicating a, dis a dissatisfaction regarding this uh, project. There were 100 people or more today indicating their dissatisfaction. It's important, of course, to, to understand the economics, et cetera, but it's also important to know why you were elected. And that is to reflect the people, not the special interests, but the people. In a democracy, that's what we're all about, the people. And I want you to remember that when you go to vote, you have an awesome responsibility. And the people have indicated loudly, I understand, this uh, business about the vocal minority. Well, if that was vocal uh, this evening, I'd like to know what loud was. And if that if that's uh, what's happening in terms of uh, the concerns of uh, citizens, you need to pay attention. And if you don't pay attention, it seems to me that's a dereliction of uh, duty. And as a teacher, I paid attention. That's how I communicated with the students and they were successful. If you wanna be successful as board members, you need to communicate directly and you need to reflect what the community has indicated. Forget the, the penny handy. Good luck and thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dagler. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Uh, my name is Jim Dagler uh, at 2343 Staley Road. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I was a little uh, confused by the discussion at the workshop tonight regarding what I understand was CAB's recommendation for a positive declaration, because uh, the discussion seemed off target with respect to the significance determination. Uh, I note that on submitting the application in February, I recall TC Buffalo requested a negative declaration be issued. And I can tell you with, with very good confidence that TC Buffalo wants to avoid a positive declaration at nearly any cost because of the scrutiny, the time and the effort that are involved in properly scoping and preparing the EIS and then uh, pursuing that to the, its end through a, a public hearing. The board doesn't need an environmental consultant to determine the significance, it's a clear choice. And there's really no question that the project meets the threshold for a positive declaration. 
I, in fact, do own and manage an actual environmental consulting firm and have been dealing with SECRA for well over 30 years. I forwarded an email this morning uh, to the information uh, email. Hopefully, you folks have that. Uh, it's very clear that uh, there's a positive declaration is way past due. And I would invite special counsel to review that list that I provided if he has not. Uh, very simply, per 617A1, to require an EIS for a proposed action, the lead agency must determine that the action may include the potential for at least one significant adverse environmental impact. And conversely, to determine that an EIS will not be required, the lead agency must determine either that there will be no adverse environmental impacts or that the identified impacts will not be significant. Uh, the application identifies the removal and destruction of large quantities of vegetation and fauna, uh, you know, destruction of uh, wildlife habitat, uh, substantial impacts on uh, what is the habitat for a species of concern. I don't know if it's been identified as a Jefferson salamander. Um, under uh, as lead agency, the uh, 617B3I whatever, must determine the significance of the action within 20 calendar days of its establishment as lead agency, or within 20 days of its receive the information it may need to make that determination. And I submit that that information has been available since February. Uh, I would like to then move on to the, so it's clear, a positive declaration is overdue. Uh, when you prepare an EIS, you also need this public scoping. And regarding this public hearing, uh, a public hearing is not necessarily a continuous event. Whenever a DIS accompanies an application, statements made at a public hearing constitute comments on the DIS, and all substantive comments must be addressed pursuant to 617.14. Accordingly, the town of Grand Island is in no position to make a decision on the application immediately or even very soon after a public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Ms. Meany, are you still here? You were our final commenter. I think you bumped off. Final call for now, Carrie. Um, you can always come in at the end of the meeting as well. Okay, we will declare the public comment on agenda items only. That portion of the meeting is closed. I want to thank everyone for comments that they brought to us tonight. They're, obviously, we have a very educated uh, public out there and uh, very well thought out arguments. Thank you very much. Next item on our agenda is the minutes from me workshop meeting number 31 from July 20th, 2020, and the meeting minutes from the regular meeting number 13 on July 20th, 2020. I'll entertain a motion to Approve those. So moved. Second. Mo motion by Tom Degatti, second by Councilman Mike Madigan. Any discussion on that? Roll call. Degatti? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Marston? Aye. Whitney? Aye. On tonight's connect consent agenda, we have the meeting minutes from the Techn Technology Advisory Board meeting from June 18th, 2020. Meeting minutes from the Board of Architectural Review from June 16th, 2020, and the meeting minutes from the Conservation Advisory Board of June 25th, 2020. I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Motion second. by Pete Marston, second by Jen Bainey. Any discussion? Roll call. Marston? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. And communications from the town board. Item number one from Supervisor John Whitney. Project L, set a public hearing. 1A is the Grand Island Commerce Center Project L of R1A preliminary plat two lot proposal. Is that what's wrong? The subdivision application is wrong. Right. Okay, so we. So we, so the uh, the public hearing isn't gonna address that. So A is not necessary. So we Okay, A, A will not be necessary due to TC Buffalo withdrawing their request for subdivision of the property. B is the application for a plan development district for Project L, local law intro number 10 of 2020 rezoning SBL 
23.00-1-50 at 2780 Long Road and SBL 23.00-1-26.1 on Bedell Road from M1 to PDD, including development plan and zoning incentive zoning application. Entertain a motion to set the public hearing for August 13th at eight o'clock PM. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock PM, I'm sorry. August, what was it? 13th. 13th. Thursday. So moved. Second. Motion Second. by Mike Madigan, second by Tom Degatti. Any discussion on that? Yeah, I guess one thing for everybody out there, uh, it's going to be a meeting where we'll have in-person attendance. Um, logistically, however, I think some of the people have read the meeting notice, but what we're really looking to do is we're going to have a, you're going to come in, you're going to say your speak, your, your three minutes, and you're going to be asked to leave. Um, outside, we're going to have um, a speaker that will be broadcasting the meeting, but obviously due to COVID, we do have to be considered the number of people that we have here. So to accommodate um, what we expect to be a large number of people, we're going to have to have people just come in, say what they need to say, and, and, and step out to listen to the rest of the meeting. The meeting will be available on the YouTube page and everything after the fact. Um, but Mike? I don't think this is intended to be our last public hearing as well. Is that the case, or what are our thoughts on about that? Especially if not all the documentation, like some folks mentioned earlier. I think we have to make that determination when we get there. Yeah. I don't know I, that we can I, say. I, do I think, wouldn't make any promises. Right. You never know. Actually, can I? I mean, this. You're just approving a, a public hearing. We're just setting a public hearing. Correct. Right. right. I know, but this is the discussion related to that, and I'm just. Well, that I, maybe this could help. We'll have a public hearing, and then at the end of that, there would be a motion to leave the public hearing open or close the public hearing. So if there's a difference, of opinion on that, we would handle that through our voting. Okay. I'm guessing. And protocol. any member of this, yeah, this I mean, council can submit a request to have another public. We're not limited on the number of public hearings we can have for this particular topic. We can have another one if we correct. want to. Yep. Is that correct? That's correct. Legally? Yep. Okay. So as long as we're not limited, um, I would think that if another proposal were put out there, there is a good chance that it would be very tough to say no to so okay any further discussion roll call madigan aye degatti aye bainey aye marston aye whitney aye item number two under the supervisor's agenda is uh island landing subdivision phase two an affidavit documenting some corrections in your packet, you will find an F my affidavit by me. I'm asking uh, authorization for the supervisor to sign said affidavit. It's uh, making some corrections to a map cover that was filed uh, back in 2019. It's just basically Scribner's errors. So, so, so moved. Second. Motion by Pete Marston, second by Tom Degatti. Any discussion on that? Roll call. Marston? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Bainey? Whitney. Aye. Item number nine on our agenda is from Councilwoman Jen Bainey, Traffic Safety Advisory Board with respect to Project Olive. Jen? Yep. First item comes directly from the Traffic Safety Advisory Board as an official communication to you. Both items that we will review tonight were, um, I believe, uh, at the request for feedback from TSAB in their review of the most current plans. As you'll see, number one is Project Olive. I'll summarize very quickly, but I'll ask you to additionally um, follow up with me for clarification or concerns, or even better, follow up with a member of traffic safety as they best represent themselves in this. Um, in the first substantial paragraph there, they are addressing um, their concerns with vehicular traffic on Bedell Road. They note an increase of 169%. They're concerned with the, the existing pavement of Bedell Road and recommending that the town board meet with the town engineer and town superintendent of highways to see if there can be a core sample that should be taken prior to any work starting on the project. Second paragraph, um, or second um, paragraph of substance talks about how uh, the response from Project Olive is that they would um, monitor the current condition of Bedell Road 
uh, for the, if there is a need for future improvements. Their concern in relation to that is who would fund those as there was nothing um, fully agreed to. Third uh, has to do with the uh, letter we received from Highway Superintendent Dick Crawford. You'll see the wording there, which um, caused Dick Crawford to bring forward the request for the regional uh, transportation meeting on August 19th. Um, they close with the remaining responses to our questions, both in writing at our meeting, will be answered to our satisfaction. If there's anything noteworthy, um, I will also pass, well, I will of course pass along submission number seven to them, and hopefully it will assuage any other concerns they had. Um, so motion to receive and file communication from the Traffic Safety Advisory Board in relation to Project Olive. So moved. Motion by, well, I believe, Jen, you're making that motion? Yes. Yeah. Mike, are you seconding, seconding that motion? Sorry. Motion. That right. Motion by Jen Bainey to receive and file, second by Mike Madigan. Any discussion on this? Roll call. Bainey? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Marston? Aye. Tugatti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item number two under Councilman Jen Bainey is the Traffic Safety Advisory Board again, but this is with respect to the South Point plan development. As Supervisor Whitney noted, they did review at their recent meeting and are providing you the feedback you requested as to a revised concept plan. As a concept plan, um, some of these details could easily be remedied, I think. They want to have Carl Road connection uh, showing the proposed public road. They don't think that's clear. And in the um, concept plan, which they have, the intersection of Carl Road and Char South Parkway is not shown. They, they don't... Um, they don't like that. Um, secondarily, a north arrow should be shown in one point, getting into more detail. They want um, a review of uh, the driveway connections to Staley Road for the number of units, which is 308 total. The site plan from March 24th shows that a connection to Glen Avon Road was planned. They want this looked at. Um, a, the argument that Heron Point didn't have one they felt couldn't stand because Heron Point was being built and will be connected Point, uh, Heron Point Phase 2 is being built and will be connected to Lake Haven Road. Um, that led into feedback for you regarding the, um, I guess, accessibility of emergency response vehicles. They wanted to make sure the turning radius template was used on all roads, of course, in addition to school buses being able to make the turn. Their final recommendation was also one that was um, noted in the previous letter we just reviewed. It referred to the regional traffic meeting. So I'll make a motion to receive and file communication from the Traffic Safety Advisory Board in relation to the revised concept plan from the South Point plan development, uh, South Point developers. Second. Motion by Jen Bainey to receive and file, second by Tom Nagati. Any discussion on this? Roll call. Bainey? Aye. Tagati? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Marston? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item uh, communications from other town officials. We have from the town attorney, Peter Godfrey, authorization filing a counterclaim regarding violations of zoning law and consent order and judgment. Uh, in your packet, you have a the resolution. I want to attend a motion to, uh, are, we, are we approving this? Yeah, a motion yeah. to adopt the resolution. To adopt this resolution. Sure. And I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution. Motion by Jen Bainey, is there a second? Second. Second by Mike Madigan. Any discussion on this? Roll call. Bainey? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Marston? Aye. Dugatti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item number two under Town Attorney Peter Godfrey is acceptance of drainage easement and land swap on Industrial Drive. A is an adoption of a resolution subject to permissive referendum, accepting the drainage easement, authorizing the supervisor to sign the drainage easement and conveyance agreement and related documents. I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve the resolution. So moved. Motion by Pete Marston. Second. Second by Tom Degatti. Any discussion on this? Roll call. Marston? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Whitney? Aye. They were all, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, no, there's the accepting the, the um, drainage easement. It was all yeah. in one. You can do it all in one. It was all oh, in one. Okay. Yeah. They're all, all approved. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, we will take it. Okay. Uh, from the Department of Engineering and Water Resources, Robert H. Westfall. Item number one is a New York State DOT Grand Island Boulevard accessibility project, pin number 5762.27, to authorize change order number one. Mr. Westfall has submitted a resolution or a, ref, a rep, referral. Please find attached change order number one. Field change number one is a ditch from station 21 plus 00 to 27 plus 00 on the right side is required to be piped creating a cross a closed drainage system instead of regrading the ditch to create a positive drainage as per the plan. Drainage cannot be completed per the, the plan because it was too shallow in the existing water main area. There's a shallow existing water main in this area, I'm sorry. Field change number two is to pipe the drainage ditch adjacent to 1976 Grand Island Boulevard at station 15 plus 00 left to improve vehicular and pedestrian safety throughout the area. Removing the deep ditch will eliminate a steep drop off and need for installing a railing. The total for change, total amount for change order number one is an increase of $66,251.25 to Novacite Company's contract and will be included in supplemental number three to the grant agreement. They're recommending approval of change order number one in the amount of $66,251.25, the Novacite Company awarded contract amount. I'll entertain a motion to approve that change order. Second. Who made it? Tom, motion by Tom Degatti, second by John Bainey. Any and discussion? John, for this one, there's no other options. I mean, that's a pretty pricey change. Yeah, it I mean, is. Have you look, kind of looked at it yourself? I or? have not. No. I have not. That's what we have a town engineer for. Okay. So, um, just as a statement, I own the property directly adjacent to it. Therefore, I, I wish to recuse. Can I also add, isn't this the one that? Uh, I'm sorry? I think the state's covering 80% of this reimbursement. That is part of the grant, yeah. So, yeah. But, but, but we shouldn't be, you know, we're not trying to be. They're, and lose. They have a set amount. That we do have. Uh, they're, they're paying into the change too, because this is. I sent some emails about this. A while. The change order has also been reviewed by the consultant who's who's doing the construction administration work on the project, CNS companies. Yeah, but so and recommended. I just was saying be, yes. Well, no, just to be clear, um, for the payment, I think it's a set amount. It's not going to change based on a change order from the state, right? Yes, it is. Lynn case, got eighty percent of eighty okay. percent of that. The one down by Pete. It, the, right. Both those modifications, I think, Lynn reached out to the state and agreed. I mean, Grand Island Boulevard is theirs, and they agreed to well, cover eighty percent of the cost. So, well, while this is that the, the, the sixty-six then isn't is only is I'm only be sure paying twenty percent of that, right? Yes. Okay. So. Yeah, that's not a typical change order process, so I could see why you would say. Yeah, but I think in they're this reimbursing case, a little inquiry yeah. by Lynn. Seems to have worked out well. Yeah, it's huge. It happened very quickly because it was. I was. I was at Pete's picking up a lawnmower one day, and it was the water was incredible. The neighbor came out. I inquired, and I kind of left it because the answer was, well, it was going to that portion of it. I think was like sixteen grand, and they didn't know if it was going to fix it. But Lynn reached out to the state, and once they agreed to, to foot most of the bill, it seemed like a no-brainer. Any further discussion? Roll call. Degatti? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Marston? Uh, recused. Whitney? Aye. Item number 12 on our agenda is uh, supervisor, Supervising Accountant Pam Barton, the employee vacation proposal. Pam writes, attached you'll find the appropriate excerpts from each bargaining unit and the employee handbook not in non-union regarding vacations and sellbacks. Um, what's being proposed is that all employees be allowed to sell back up to 80 hours of vacation, provided that at least 80 hours are used. This will benefit the CSEA unit. Uh, all employees are eligible for vacation sellback when the 120 hour accrual level. This will benefit the Teamsters and the AFSCME unit. And all employees will be eligible to carry over up to 80 hours of vacation to 2021. This will benefit all employees across all units and non-union. She's making this request one time ask due to COVID-19 crisis. Many employees work through the pause, particularly water and sewer plant operators, which by the way, I wanna make special note of that our water and sewer plant operators worked tirelessly throughout this whole pandemic. Um, remain careful in their personal lives so as to not impact other coworkers and operations 
critical to the town systems. That commitment to the town meant that they did not take any personal time off at all and manned the plant 24 seven. They along with other essential water, sewer and highway and support workers provided essential service with barely a hiccup. Additionally, now that we have returned to full force, many employees have had to cancel plans due to many travel restrictions. They have been told by their supervisors they are not allowed to leave New York State and none of it and will not be granted time off if it includes such travel. So the employees understand the necessity of this mandate, but it makes utilization of accrued vacation time even more difficult. Family weddings, births, deaths, like everyone else, employees have been affected. So it's a one-time request and uh, she's requesting that the town board approve the bolded items as presented. And number two, the board authorizes the supervisor to sign any memorandums of understanding with the bargaining units. The memorandums will be drafted as necessary to maintain or to memorialize a one-time event and change these changes to these specific, specifically negotiated items from the current contract language. Okay. Entertain a motion to approve her request. So moved. Second. Motion by Tom Nagati, second by Mike Madigan. Discussion. And I mean, in terms of water and sewer, they had to shift their, their schedule to try and spread people out because one of the biggest risks is if there was a bad contamination, we would have been in very serious trouble with the water. The plant operators could not do that though. Yeah. They had absolutely no leeway. What they did was they wiped down at the end of their shift. Yeah. Uh, they met outside, they social distanced, discussed what was going on with the plant for 15 minutes. And then the new operator came on and took over. And again, the same process was repeated 24 seven throughout this entire pandemic. Right. Keeping the water in the sewer was going was a critical requirement for obvious reasons. So. I, mean, I think that this is a small way of saying thank you to those guys, especially with the seemingly ever growing list of states to which we can't travel. I mean, that's another thing that's changed over the course of the time we've been considering this is now I think it's we're well over half the states that, that we can't go to. And, you know, I think I've looked to try and go to somewhere in New York and that's difficult now too, because every state's dealing with the same problem. Any further discussion? Roll call. Tagati? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Marston? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item number two from Pam Barton is a budget amendment with respect to the Golden Age Center. Has, they have seen a market increase in the Meals on Wheels program usage by its member due to the COVID-19 crisis. Some members have a real need, but limited funds to pay for the interim program. The town has funds that were donated slash contributed just for situations like this. Therefore, Jen Menner is requesting a transfer of $115 from these contributions to aid one member for the month of July. So her, our approval is requested for the following budget amendment slash transfer for 2020. We're going to decrease the cash in trust and agency by $115, decrease the liability from M Meals on Wheels donations, which is a, now that's that first one was a credit. This is a debit of $115. And then increase the cash and general fund as a debit, $115 and increase liability of Meals on Wheels donation by $115. I'm taking a motion to approve Pam's request. So moved. Second. Motion by Pete Marson, second by Mike Madigan. Any discussion on that? Roll call. Marston? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Gotti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item number 13 from the Code Enforcement Office. Special number one is a special use permit renewal for Grand Island Solar LLC at 126 Industrial Drive, Community Solar Array Project. The uh, project has been inspected, uh, it is unchanged. So I'll entertain a motion to approve that special use permit. So moved. Motion by Pete Meyerson. Second. Second by Tom Bugatti. Discussion. Roll call. Marston? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item number two is a special use permit renewal for Arlene Clark, 3059 2nd Avenue. It's a home occupation barbershop. Um, the property has been inspected. It remains unchanged. I'll entertain a motion to approve the special use permit. So moved. Second. Motion by Tom Degatti, second by Jennifer. Mike. Jen. Second. Jen, Mike. Oh, okay. Jennifer Bainey, Mike Madigan, I'm sorry, Jen. 
Okay. Um, any discussion on that? Roll call. Beanie? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Marston? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item number three is a special use permit renewal for North Point Vantage, 2420 Love Road, home occupation, embroidery, silk screening, fabrics, and sports apparel. The property has been inspected and there is, it remains unchanged. I want to change a motion to approve the special use for, renew the special use permit. So moved. Second. Motion by John Bainey, second by Pete Marston. Any discussion on that one? Roll call. Bainey? Aye. Matt Marston? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. A uh, special use permit renewal from Smith and Taylor LLC at 1693 Love or Grand Island Boulevard. It's used car sales. Again, the property has been inspected. Uh, it remains unchanged. And I'll entertain a motion to renew their special use permit. So moved. Second. Second. Motion was Tom Bugatti. I'm, I'm sorry, Mike. Mike. And second by Pete. Any discussion on that one? Roll call. Madigan? Aye. Marston? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item number five is a tower permit renewal for Upstate Cellular Network, which is Verizon at 1639 West River Road. Uh, Ready for the motion? I am um, just looking at what it the difference is. I'll, I'll enter yes, but fees have been paid and uh, I'll entertain yes. a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Motion by Jen Bainey, second by Tom Bugatti. Roll call. Or is there any discussion? I'm sorry. No discussion. Roll call. Bainey? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Marston? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item number six is a special use permit renewal for Grand Island Development LLC, 1611 Whitehaven Road, solar array project. Uh, the special use, uh, it's checked on change and fees have been paid. We've talked about tabling this one. Do we need to do the motion first? I, well, because we can, of the um, well, pollinators and right. them not fulfilling yeah, their we, commitments on that we one. We haven't got a chance to get legal advice on how to take this during the executive, but I, mean, I think Chuck could probably. I think it would be appropriate if you have a concern with the compliance with the special use permit conditions to table it and then take a look at it. Yeah. Put it on at the next meeting and see what's, what the status is. Okay. I, I don't have any details on this particular. Matter. I think there's there's absolutely issues. You need this is this is a, a special counsel. I did talk to Ron Milks, and he said he believes that they are still outstanding on that too. Well, John and I met with them early this year, and they, there's big there's big issues as far as the landscaping and that stuff that they haven't done. So we, it's oh, more than just okay. pollinators. That, yeah. So we definitely need to table this and revisit. Okay. What's going on? So. Yeah, so Ron, we have Ron a motion by Mike Madigan to table. Is there a second? Second, second by Tom Bugatti. Any discussion further on that? Roll call. Madigan? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Marston? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item number seven is a special use permit renewal for Gail Villani at 5302 East River Road for the keeping of up to one agricultural animal. So uh, moved. Second. Motion by Tom Degatti, second by Madigan. Jen Bainey. Madigan. Any discussion on that? Actually, the comment said there were no animals, but. Right, I saw that, yeah. Keeping the options open. Like Keeping the options here. open, exactly. Any further discussion? Roll call. Madigan? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Marston? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item number eight is a special use permit renewal for Grand Island Solar LLC at 2411 Dell Road Community Solar Array Project. Uh, fees have been, paid, have been paid, it remains unchanged. Entertain a motion to renew the special use permit. So moved. Second. Motion by Pete Morrison, second by Jen Bainey. Any discussion? Roll call. Marston? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Item number nine from the code enforcement office is a resignation. Members of the town board, uh, William Shaw's resignation letter. Um, and this is from Ronald Milks, our 
department head and code enforcement officer. I made a request of Mr. Shaw to submit a resignation letter to officially mark his last day of employment and begin his successful transition into retirement. He unfortunately has refused to submit a resignation letter. So I'm sending this letter as a demarcation point for his file. Mr. Shaw's last day of employment was July 6th, 2020. He officially began his retirement on July 7th, 2020. Please let me know if you need anything further to complete his employment history. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to accept Mr. Shaw's. That's not Mr. Shaw's though. So what are we accepting? Mr. Shaw's resignation via the code enforcement office. Perhaps uh, we accept with, with Mr. a Milk's explanation. <laughs> with, with a certificate of appreciation to Mr. Shaw for his years of service. Very good. That I support. Thank you. Second. Motion by Pete Marston, second by Jen Bainey. Roll call. Marston? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Bugatti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. From item number 14, from the assessor, Judy Tafelski, there's a request to split off a parcel of 127.5 feet by 250 feet from lot number SBL 37.03-3-37.111. The owner is requesting uh, we split off a building lot that's fronting on Stony Point Road. I looked at the zoning today, it is uh, zoned R1B, which is a 120 by 250 zoning. So that has more than required frontage. It does have the required depth. And uh, entertain a motion to accept this request. So moved. Uh, second and discussion. Motion by Mike, was it? And second by Pete. Thank you. And the question. Are we creating a new building lot where we need to imply recreation fees here? It would be creating a new building lot. So you want it with recreation fees, Correct. applicable recreation fees. Correct. Okay. You okay with that, Mike? Yes. Are you okay with amending your motion? Yes. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Roll call. Madigan? Aye. Marston? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Bugatti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Report of the audit committee, Jen motion to pay the following amounts from the following accounts. General fund, $53,532. Highway fund, $18,121.97. Sewer fund, $21,633.49. Water fund, $4,943.58. Trust and agency fund, $150.65. Capital Fund, $156,263.99, for a grand total of $254,645.68. Second. Did you get my email? Yeah. Whatever it was. It was hey. peanuts. <laughs> what a vacation. <laughs> I'm sorry. Motion by Jen Bainey, second by Bugatti. Tom Bugatti, Tom Bugatti um, to pay the bills. Roll call. Bainey? Aye. Bugatti? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Marston? I have to recuse $20. <laughs> I don't even think it was 20 Yeah. I think it was 19 and change. Yeah. Yeah. Whitney? Aye. Item number 16 is unfinished business, special use permit application for Karen Panzarella at 2894 East River Road for a bed and breakfast. I believe this all remains table till it sees the planning board. Okay, planning okay. Board. It's, it's in planning board in South Point. I think same. Is the same thing as same remaining discussion. table. That brings us to the public comment suspend period. Suspend 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 the rules. Rules. We have to suspend the rules first. Okay, I'm sorry. Entertain a motion to suspend the rules to, uh, we have two, Appointments so moved. tonight. Second. So we have a motion by Jen Bainey, second by Pete Marston on the first one. We will do that, but the, we're just doing it for the first one right okay. now. All right. And then we'll, we'll go from there. Okay. If you need me to change the rules. I'm sorry. Is that okay? If you need to change? No, we're just we're just suspending the rules for we'll right now for a personal appointment. We need to vote on it. Yes, we're going to do that. 
Give me a chance. Okay. Stay in your lane, boss. Keep an eye on you. Roll call. Beanie? Aye. Marston? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Whitney? Aye. First item that I have is a permanent appointment. The results of the Erie County Civil Service Examination for the title of Recreation Supervisor for Senior Citizens has been received. Based on these results, recommended that Jennifer Mentor of 1043 Stony Point Road, Grand Isle, New York, be moved from provisional appointment into permanent appointment in this position. All the criteria have been met. There is no change in either salary grade or step required. So moved. Motion by Pete Marston. Second. Second by Mike Madigan. And Jen uh, scored very high on the test, so she's she's reachable. Well deserved. Well deserved. Yes, Not she surprising. does an excellent job. Roll call. Marston. Aye. Madigan. Aye. Bainey. Aye. Degatti. Aye. Whitney. Aye. The next, we need to suspend the rules again for a personnel position change. So moved. Second. Motion by. Pete Marston, second by Tom Degatti. Roll call. Marston? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Uh, earlier this evening, um, Judy Topelski explained to us that uh, they are working to do more of the assessment work and appraisal work in house instead of relying on consultants for this. And as such, she is asking for that Jackie Lynn McGinty be moved from grade seven at $25.93 an hour to grade eight at $28.16 an hour. She has taken the test and passed and this test will expire in November, Pete. I believe that's right. Yeah. Do you remember the title of the test? Um, real property, real appraiser, property appraiser. appraiser. Real property appraiser, Correct. thank you. So we're going to be uh, moving Jackie into that position. So moved. Motion by Pete Marston. Second. Second by Tom Degatti. Any discussion on that? Since this is a long time coming, and this is a really great thing that we're starting to take on our own. And this, what this will do ultimately will save the town money because we will not be using consultants. We'll be doing it with in-house forces. So for the incremental amount that she's being in, increased in wages, uh, we'll, get, we'll get that money back. Big return on investment. Yes. yes. Good, good ROI on this. Yep. Uh, roll call. Marston? Aye. Degatti? Aye. Madigan? Aye. Bainey? Aye. Whitney? Aye. Now we can do the public comment portion. At this point in time, we uh, open up to public comments for any item. If you've already spoken tonight on a certain item, um, we don't need to hear it again. But anything else that anyone wants to speak on? I've got Mike Rahill would like to make a comment. So, Mr. Rahill. Mr. Rahill? Yes, thanks, here. Tom. Uh, yes, uh, with respect to the public comments I made earlier, I, out of respect for the three minute limit, I shortened my comments. And I was very encouraged a few minutes ago that James Murray Coleman and Kimberly Nason were silently participating in this meeting in Zoom because what I wanted to say was give a couple examples uh, using both James Murray Coleman and Kimberly Nason as examples. But I see James Murray Coleman has dropped off. I think Kimberly Nason is still on. Uh, just as a reminder, and I won't repeat myself, the purpose of my comments before was to ask the board if, if people opposed to the project Olive could have a seat at the table. And the examples I wanted to use but didn't have time to give were, for example, when James Murray Coleman of Trammell Crow Buffalo mentioned that Project Olive is only five stories tall. Well, the current building code limit calls for a limit of four stories tall. He failed to mention that Project Olive's total height exceeds current building codes by almost 100%. There is a huge variation in height per story in the construction trades. If there was a chance for real time feedback from an opposing view, this deception 
would have been challenged right away instead of letting it creep into the minds of those who would support this project's request for deviation approval. Another example would be when Philip Slidell's representative, Kimberly Nason said that she, quote, firmly believes that this initiative will be of substantial long-term benefit to the town without compromising the vibrancy or tranquility of the Grand Island community. The presence of another person with an opposing view in real time with unfettered access to the town board who represents a large contingent of Grand Island residents would have been able to challenge this statement as either being from a totally incompetent source or from a very clever biased source with a vested interest in having the town approve the request for variances. And by the way, final comment, this large group of Grand Island citizens has been characterized by those supporting Project Olive as the vocal minority. The group whom this critic is referring to is cred for GI. It was founded on July 1st, one month ago. It has already amassed 1,800 signatures on a petition recommending the town board refuse to approve the enabling deviations for Project Gallup. And cred for GI has also received the support of hundreds of people who are not Grand Islanders but appreciate the unique environment which exists on Grand Island. Thank you very much for the second opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Rahill. Is there anyone else that would like to make a public comment? For a third and final time. Oh, wait, Ms. Meany. And she, we, we missed her earlier, so that's good she's back. Ms. Meany, the floor is yours. Thanks for raising your hand. I apologize. I think you dropped off earlier. Yes, I'm sorry. My laptop ran out of its battery. Um, I just wanted to say in response, um, there was a gentleman that said that um, Jen Bainey needed to recuse herself because her property was right near the um, proposed Amazon project, the entrance. And I just wanted to say um, in contradiction to that, that when I went to, the, to vote last year, I voted for Jen Bainey because I feel that she most represents me. She lives down the road from me. She's a young mom. She loves Grand Island. She's active in her church. And I think she really represents me. And I need her at the table to speak for me. And all of us, all five of you are representative of us in our homes, our communities, and our families. And I just wanted to have the counterpoint that, you know, I am definitely in opposition to this project. And I hope that you're all thinking about all of us and our families when you uh, come to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank Meany. Thank you very much. Anyone else? For the third and final time, is there anyone else that wishes to speak on any item to the town board? Declare that portion of the meeting closed. From the town board. Start with Jen. So on a different topic, um, just a little update from the Gold Mage Center. Uh, Mrs. Mentor sends us updates regularly. And in the last meeting, uh, we approved or accepted um, uh, the activities that have been happening. And she mentioned how during this pandemic, she's actually been able to acquire 17 new Meals on Wheels volunteers. As you can imagine, many of the people who volunteer are not um, able to now because they're part of a vulner vulnerable population group. But I would think it's many Islanders that have stepped up to take and help in this way. Um, and that's just amazing. I, I love how when this crisis happens, people on Grand Island aren't running from it, they're running to it to help those who need it. Um, that's the definition of a Grand Islander and I'm just so proud of them for it. Some of these people are teachers and others who will not be able to continue. So I just encourage you to reach out to Jen Mentor and she will be looking for more help. I have a feeling it will just be as beneficial to you as it would be to those who would be receiving your assistance. On a more serious note and a hard topic as I'm sure you all know by now, I never shy away from those. 
there's been lots of communication and related in relation to our large scale um, project here, Project Amazon, that's being considered. Um, at any time of the day, we as board members can receive an e two different emails, two completely factual emails. They'll arrive to us from residents and, they, and the residents have arrived at different conclusions. So they can be very factual and two people can have very strong but different opinions. So with some of our large scale situations, we have even as a board, we're not going to agree. Um, it's just part of our nature. We're not going to agree on everything. Uh, Mrs. Meany pointed out tonight, she and I see eye to eye on a lot of things, but I would be, um, it would be very inappropriate of me to think that everyone feels the same way that I do on many issues. Tonight's communication, um, I think Tom would agree, this was very easy to manage because tonight's communication was incredibly civil, incredibly respectful, very, very nice. Um, but I, unfortunately, I don't see the same thing happening on the internet. One way that I know we will all lose in this is that if we, if we don't fix our behavior as an island on the internet, the vilification of each other is so embarrassing to me. I don't want my children to ever see it. It's so unfortunate the way some of our Islanders, and maybe it's not you that's watching this, but if it's you, it's so hurtful, so hard. We will all lose if we continue to vilify each other, even over a tense topic. So please, if you're willing, please do not hurt each other. This could affect relationships for years or decades down the road. Um, at the national level and the state level, we know relationships are sever severed because of the disunity that happens within the political arena. And I just beg you, as much as it depends on you, to try to find a way to keep unity, even when we disagree, even when the stakes are high, and communicate in a civil and respectful manner. Thank you. Tom Bugatti. I cannot agree with that more. Um, I don't think any one of the five of us is gonna say that we're dealing with this perfectly but we are doing the best we can and we are putting everything we've got into this. John, myself, and Dick Crawford drove out to Clay, New York on Wednesday and took a look at what was going on there. And I urge anybody who thinks it's purely in an industrial area to go look at a map because there's a lot of houses, a lot of residences, a lot closer than this facility would be to even the people on West River and Long. And that was a golf course they destroyed. I really a, find that highly objectionable. Exactly. It was a golf course, which, yeah, as a golfer, I find it problematic, but um, there's always houses around golf courses, and there are there. It's no different. Just one example of one of the things that's kind of going around the internet and causing some divisiveness when it's not entirely factually true. I know I've spent plenty of time. I've talked to Mr. Rejo. I've talked to Mrs. Rejo. I've talked to tons of residents on the phone. We are all here at your disposal if you have questions. We just, we can't we can't sit on social media and, and deal with every piece of misinformation that's out there. But the reality is we're all giving this our all. And we're doing this, uh, I can't even count the number of hours that I've spent pouring through this stuff and looking at research online. And I'm not looking for facts that fit a narrative. I'm looking for facts that will lead us to make a good decision. And the way I view this through Seeker and through this process, is we're not looking for CAB or the planning board or any other advisory board from this town to make the decision for us. We're looking for the insight from residents and from those boards to give us some information as to things we need to look at at this project, things we can work with the, with the developer so that when it comes time to vote, we are voting on the project we think is best. And that's not to say it's one that assuredly gets approved, but it's the best one we can possibly get before us. And by taking a staunch, no position, this will never happen, you don't get that dialogue, even from CAB. They sent a few questions, but we got something saying no. Uh, as a councilman, I'd prefer something saying, you know what, we don't want it, because of course it's eliminating green space. But here's some things you should look at. I think anybody sitting here can agree that although 100 feet might be tall, going up 100 feet instead of making, it, making them spread it out and, and taking out over a million square feet of green space is more beneficial for the environment. It's simply just, it's not as simple as just say no. And this board is doing everything we can. We're going to have our public hearing. We've had a public comments email open for months, and we receive at least 25 emails a day. And we're reading every one of them. We're digesting it all. And we're doing everything we can. And I urge all of you to do the same, to take the time to 
to truly investigate it, to not just find the facts that fit your narrative, but to do the work and get to the bottom of it. And if we can be of assistance as you do that, we'd appreciate it. And if you could be of our assistant, we'd appreciate that too. Thank you, Tom. Mike Madigan. I'm gonna just play off of what I just heard as well. Um, I, I do think it's important that friendships be maintained because I do think there can be a lot of polarization on this on this particular issue. I, I can say on this board, we've been in very heated debates before and go out for a soda pop and pizza afterwards. I mean, you can be passionate about something. You can engage someone. Don't personally attack. Stay professional. It can be done effectively, and that's really how, you know, Sometimes you'll learn something in that process as long as you don't personalize it and just stay on the, the, the problem, not on, don't focus on the person. And I can also say that, you know, the emails, very important. I think communicating with this board, conveying what your opinions are, um, you may not immediately hear a response. There's just so many things coming in from so many directions, whether it's text messages, emails, um, so many phone calls that I'm getting. Um, so you won't always immediately hear a response, but I can say that the cumulative weight, you know, pro, con, whatever your position is, if you want to have an impact or at least voice your, your opinion, it can have an impact on people's opinions and positions. So um, also the peaceful protests, like what we saw earlier, there were um, numerous people out front. Um, I think that's very positive and that also conveys a message and you know, it does put political pressure on the on the town board. So anyways, um, that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Pete Marston. I would kind of echo some of my, my fellow board members' statements. Um, and I think they pretty much covered it for the most part. So I'm, I'm going to say nothing. I'm going to echo Pete Marston's statement. <laughs> I've had enough. I guess the point is, at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah. you guys, you guys have all been very eloquent tonight. And... Uh, Thank you all for your comments. Uh, so a motion is in order to adjourn tonight's meeting at 10, 13 p.m. So moved. Motion by Tom Gatti. Second. Second by Mike Madigan. Can we go longer? <laughs> all those in favor signify aye. by saying aye. Any opposed? That's carried. Please rise. Tonight we will observe a moment of silence in memory of Gertrude Trudy Walbert, William T. Bill McKibben and Bryce David Shipman. We're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.